Raise your hand in the air. Everybody. Fab. Now, I only want you to lower your hand if you've ever tried to lose weight simply to fit into an outfit. Lower your hand if you've ever tried slimming tablets or perhaps used a weight loss shake. These might not apply to you, but lower your hand if you've ever done some exercise simply to burn off energy eaten that day. Lower your hand if you follow or like clean eating content on social media. Lower your hand if you've ever eaten so much that you felt uncomfortably full. <laughs> I can't see anybody's hand remaining. You might be surprised to learn that these are all disordered eating behaviours. Now, I'm not saying we have a room full of people with an eating disorder. Not for one minute. What I am saying is that disordered eating is completely acceptable. None of us are immune. What if it didn't have to be like this? What if weight was not the only measure of health? What if we learned to honour our hunger and trust our own fullness? What if the next generation could grow up learning to eat food for the purpose of nourishing their bodies. My name's Ash, and I'm a registered dietitian. But I'm also the mother of two small children. And I want to change the narratives around food and weight for them. So, the Oxford Dictionary defines diet as the food and drink that we consume regularly, basically what we eat. However, the term has become synonymous with the restriction of energy to make our bodies smaller. Every diet follows the same formula. You take one magic ingredient, that could be apple cider vinegar, cayenne pepper, even butter. Then, crucially, you must combine this with a fear of fatness. Then you need to add some bad foods to avoid, or if you're feeling ambitious, an entire food group, say carbohydrate, dairy. Then you stir quickly to achieve rapid weight loss. Despite the simplicity of this formula, the same diets appear time and time again. You may have heard of the cabbage soup diet, which became popular in the 1950s. Every few years it reappears. Last year, it trended on a social media platform popular with teenagers. It's since had almost 10 million views. Dieting behaviour is presenting in children as young as six years of age. My daughter turns six next year. I never want her on a cabbage soup diet. I want her to grow up learning to nourish and respect her body. We've all seen the media headlines, childhood obesity, it's rising. A public health concern, for sure. But what we don't see is that more children are dieting than have obesity. By the time a child is 13 years of age, out of a class of 30 children, 12 are already on a diet. 12 children out of a class of only 30, dieting. Current estimates predict that less than 1% of us are meeting nutrition recommendations. Yet young people approach dieting by removing foods from their diet, moving them further away from these nutrition recommendations. If we want to make a real difference to the health of the next generation, then we need to reframe all of our disordered attitudes towards food and weight. So let's have a think about how we regulate our eating. A baby emerges from the womb 
intuitively feeding whenever they need. Yet, society teaches us that we must establish them on a three- or four-hourly routine, something that actually disrupts that delicate ecosystem of milk supply and demand. My two-year-old requires around 1,200 calories a day. However, some days he eats more food than a Tour de France cyclist, <laughs> and on others he barely glances in the direction. Yet he grows well because he is intuitive. We all remember being a child. How did we get dessert? Well, we earned it by being good, by finishing the food on our plate. From that moment that we are born, we are learning not to listen to our body's hunger and fullness cues. And then, there's how we think about body weight. So my kids watch a popular TV series about a family of pigs, <laughs> featuring a daddy who has a big tummy, is lazy and quite greedy. You might know about a book series about a teenage wizard who attends a magical boarding school, featuring a cousin who has a bigger body, is spoilt, cruel, and not very clever. Even before we have exposed young people to the toxic messages on social media around body, they absorb negative attitudes towards bigger bodies. Our bodies are amazing. Every breath that we take involves tens of muscles and chemical reactions. Yet young people are growing up thinking of food as good or bad, never nourishing or fueling. Let me tell you about a young person that I might meet in my job. We'll call her Amy. I met Amy when she was admitted to hospital and diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. If you don't know about it, type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune condition where the body stops producing insulin. Insulin is the hormone that turns the food that we eat into energy. Without insulin, we won't survive. Diabetes was a shock for Amy and her family. Yet, she was a pleasure to support through intensive education, where I taught her about diabetes, nutrition, and how to adjust her insulin depending on what she was eating. As that life-saving insulin treatment began, Amy's hollow cheeks became red and rosy again. She sported a smile that would light up this room. Then, teenage years hit. Amy, who'd always been a little bit bigger than her friends, decided, like many teenagers before her, that she was going to go on a diet. She started by cutting out all of the bad foods. Then she started skipping meals. Every night, her starving body would come home, and she would binge on the foods that she had restricted all day. A common scenario for teenagers. Yet, Amy had type 1 diabetes. So, Amy decided that she would start to cut back on the insulin, the very drug that had saved her life. So that she would not absorb the calories eaten. Amy's mother noticed that her weight was fluctuating. She expressed concern to her friends and her family, but was reassured that Amy had a bigger body and it would do her no harm to lose weight. It did do her harm. Every time that Amy cut back on her insulin, 
she was causing unseen damage to every organ in her body. She was toying with death. Amy was admitted to hospital in life-threatening diabetic ketoacidosis, a consequence of the lack of insulin. I'd like to tell you at this point that I was the hero in this story, that I swooped in and I helped Amy rebuild a healthy relationship with food and body. But no. I was a villain. I was the one, in meeting best clinical practice, that had taught Amy to look at nutrition labels. I'd shown her how to weigh her food. I'd given her the technology so that she could see the impact of every food she ate on her blood glucose levels. And I hadn't warned her parents that this could happen. I didn't protect Amy. There was no hero in this story. Amy no longer attends my clinic, or any clinic. She arrives in accident and emergency, very unwell, on a regular basis. You see, Amy has a significant eating disorder, one that she may never recover from, an eating disorder that she may never even survive. A cancer diagnosis would have given Amy an 81% chance of survival over the next 10 years. But a diagnosis of type 1 diabetes alongside an eating disorder like anorexia nervosa, gives Amy only a 66% chance of survival. <coughs> One out of every three Amys will not survive the next 10 years. I've changed my clinical practice because of young people like Amy. I now spend more time exploring nourishing messages around food and body and weight to protect young people. But you know what? It's not enough. I need to do more. We need to do more. Because the system is broken. Our bodies are amazing. They deserve to be treated with respect and compassion. It is time. It's time to call out toxic diet culture. We need to recognize that this formula, it's broken. It's time to call ourselves out. If we don't want our children on cabbage soup diets, then why shouldn't we question the latest fad or trend that we follow? <coughs> it's time and we must change the narratives around food and weight to protect that next generation.